Good morning, and welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday morning. I am so glad that you are here today. I hope that you feel the welcoming spirit of Jesus Christ as we gather together today in his name. The ushers are going to pass out the friendship registers. I invite you to sign your name and let us know that you're here, and I'm going to let you know about a few announcements in the life of the church. A uh, spiritual formation team is going to meet after worship today, so if you're part of that group, we're in the church library, so come on over there and we'll talk a little bit about some of uh, the activities we have going on. And tonight, we'll have a healing service at 7 p.m., and so if you haven't come to one of these before, this is an opportunity for individual prayer. Um, you are invited at this service to come forward for laying on of hands and prayer for a specific reason or you can um, just come and be part of the congregation. Uh, I just invite everybody or anybody who's interested to come to that service tonight at seven o'clock healing service here at the church. There will be no Taze this Tuesday. I have a conflict, so don't come Tuesday night because I won't be here. But Tuesday in the afternoon, Brown Bag is starting a new book. So I just wanna invite anybody that's interested. We are gonna start reading the Land is Not Empty. It's a book by an indigenous woman about the church's role in the doctrine of discovery and the treatment of uh, native peoples uh, since the founding of this country and beyond. Uh, it promises to be a rich discussion topic. So if you're at all interested in this, we meet Tuesdays at one o'clock in the church library. 
everybody's invited to attend. So we're starting a new book. If you want to join us, this is a great time. And then uh, looking ahead, Holy Week is coming up. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. And then during Ho Holy Week, we will have Taze that Tuesday. On Friday of Holy Week, we will have our Good Friday service at 7 p.m. And we will be having communion that night. And so that's our communion for the month of April. So make sure that if you really, really want to have communion in April, you come to Good Friday service. And then Easter Sunday is in two weeks from today. We will not be having Sunday school because we're having breakfast at 930. And then there'll be a, some activities for the kids. Egg hunt at 10 o'clock for the kids and then worship at our normal time. So be looking ahead. Holy Week is coming up. And then finally, uh, if you're interested in supporting our Journey Home project with lunches on Tuesdays, there's a little piece of paper on the tables at the back that lets you know about some announcements that they can use as they continue to work to feed our homeless friends on Tuesdays. So if you're interested in helping with that, there's a little piece of paper to grab um, so that you can see kind of what they want. Are there any other announcements this morning? Yeah, Teresa. Christian Education, Christian Education Committee will meet next Sunday after worship. Other announcements? Birthdays in the choir. Jerry and Rick. Let's sing. Any other announcements this morning? All right. That's good. Let's begin our worship service then with the choir. season of hope, birds singing, trees flowering out, Royals fans saying, this could be the year. <laughs> Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. O people of God, hope in the Lord. Wait for the Lord. Let us worship God.
Please be seated. To set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Trusting in the spirit of God, let us confess our sin. Please join with me in the prayer of confession printed in your bulletin. Oh Lord, if you held our sin against us, who could live, who could stand? We seem to have more faith in death than hope in your promise of life. We seek peace through war and find security in weapons. We abandon the hungry, sick, and dying and pursue wealth by making others poor. And even so, you love us. Still, there is forgiveness with you. Therefore, we worship you, for you alone, O Lord, can save us from death and redeem us from sin. Amen. O oh, dry bones, hear the word of God. If Jesus Christ dwells in you, the spirit of God will be your life and the grace of God will be your righteousness. And if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, then God who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Know this to be true today in your heart and be at peace. Amen. Friends, as we have been forgiven in Jesus Christ, we are called then to forgive each other. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Please turn and share a sign of peace with your neighbors. Hello, neighbors. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Oh, I'm hanging in there. I'm having a nice week. Oh, my. Well, okay. Prayers. Uh-oh, I think Tom, oh, I guess he just muted the service. Oh, oh that's no, funny. not yet. Yeah. I kind of like to hear the background noise, makes me feel like I'm there, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but he says it's better that way. I don't know, I don't know. Good morning, Ms. Kinder. Good morning to you, Carolyn. <laughs> How Hi, are Sandra. you today? I'm fine. I, I got ready for this. So. <laughs> you look, you I wondered if you'd come. <laughs> Carolyn, what's your last name? My last name is Peters. I am Henry Crow's sister. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Super. I was trying to place whether I'd ever met you Love before. Yep, I've been in church, been church a, a, a few times. Um, I live in Colorado, so ah, we get together when we can. I used to live in Denver. Oh, yeah. I live in uh, north of Steamboat Springs. Ah, okay. Where we've had 400, 400 something inches of snow. It's been crazy. Yeah, my brother just moved to the state of Nevada near Reno, and uh, my college graduate school, no, college roommate moved from San Diego to Grass Valley, California, which is just across the border from Reno. And after 40 years in San Diego, she's really. <laughs> struggling with the whole snow and rain thing yeah <laughs> and that, then the forest fires in the summer <laughs> oh right right well hopefully we've had enough snow now that we're not going to have forest fires and we'll have a nice easy runoff no oh, flood. <laughs> let's hope let's hope and you have hopefully hello cynthia um hopefully enough water for the summer too so <laughs> Plenty, plenty of water. Yeah, plenty of water. I know the snowpack, that's what it depends on. Yes, it does. 
Yeah, and all of our reservoirs are filling. It's, All it's right. Great. Super. That's wonderful. Grown-ups are sitting <laughs> down and kids are coming up. I'm going. It is children's here. serving time. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Hello. It's very hard to see out of these glasses. Do you ever get jealous? You kind of like them. Wait till you try them on, bro. They are hard to see out of. Do you ever get jealous? Jealous? Never? Wait. Yes. You want a horse and jealous of who might have a horse. Jealousy is when we see things or people have things happen and we want to be part of it. We want to have what they have. Jealous of the seat right next to Pastor Heather. We want to have it. When you're jealous, you can't see very clearly. Try on my jealous glasses. Try them on. Can you see? Yeah, try them. Everybody try the jealousy glasses. When you try, when you're looking with the eyes of jealousy, let me put my real glasses in my pocket here before I get in trouble. When you're looking with the eyes of jealousy, it's really hard to tell what things are. But when you're looking through the eyes of love, you could see really clear. Now I see. You think these are the eyes of jealousy? Well, just look through those. They are they are a mess. Here, let's. You can't see it here. Let somebody else try them. So these are the eyes of love and joy. Can you can you imagine if something good happened to somebody else and you felt joy for them? Can you imagine? Yeah, if somebody else got a horse, would you be happy for them or would you be jealous? Yeah, you'd be happy for them if they like it. Whoa, hey. Are you loving him? That's nice. Here, let's pass, let's pass the glasses around. Try the glasses. So these are the joy glasses. They used to put sparkles on people, but they've gotten old. They don't have sparkles as much. There's a little sparkle on the bottom, but they used to sparkle. These are the, well, try them on. Did you try them? Did you try them? Did you want to try them? No. Yeah, you want to go first on the good glasses? You want to put those back on? You want to try the good ones? You don't want to? Do you want to? <sighs> when you look through the eyes of joy, Everything's clearer and happier. What do you think? Dude. I'm going to put my regular ones back on. Oh, oh, oh. So it's really hard to be happy for somebody sometimes if they get something that we want. You know, like I think, or if something good happens for somebody, like if someone at school gets the really cool shoes, are you jealous? Yeah, right. Or if someone gets a prize, like what if you guys went out for ice cream after church, but only Ruth got ice cream? Would you be happy for Ruth? Are you serious? Well, I would be jealous. I would be sad. I would want some. I I know that I struggle with jealousy. I want what other people have. I want what other people have. I want to see what they have. I want to have a bigger house. I want to have a fancier car, right? I want to have more money so we can go on a vacation. I want the things other people have. And sometimes I get jealous of what other people have, and it's hard for me to be happy for other people. Do you think so? That's right. Sometimes people might get jealous of me. I think... Pretty soon we're going to have Good Friday where we talk about Jesus dying. And one of the reasons that they killed Jesus was because they were jealous of him. Because the people liked him and he had power. He could do miracles. Then they were jealous. And so these jealousy eyes can be really dangerous. They make us not nice people. But if we can look through the eyes of love, wherever those glasses went, <laughs> then then we can celebrate with everybody for their goodness. It's hard. It's hard even when, it, when you grow up. That's a hard one all the time. Let's say a prayer. 
God, help us not to look with the eyes of jealousy, which cloud our vision, but instead look with the eyes of joy and love at the world around us. May we celebrate with everyone when they have good things. Amen. Thanks for trying on my glasses. Did you get a sparkle in your eye? That's not good. I'm sorry. I kind of like You like those ones? Yeah. They are bug eyes. You're right. That's what they are. You like these ones? Yeah. The new revised standard version of the Bible, the red Bible in our pew, has been removed from the Bible Gateway website and replaced with the NRSV updated edition. Uh, I'm going to be reading from that one today. If you want to see if you can catch the differences, uh, we'll be reading Galatians 5, 13 through 26 on page 948 of the Red Bibles. Again, Galatians 5, 13 through 26 on page 948. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become enslaved to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. These are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousings, and things like these. I'm warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things, and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. For the words of Galatians, thanks be to God.
Thank you, choir. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, as we gather around your word in scripture, we ask that you would open our minds and hearts. We might have a fresh understanding of who you are and who you call us to be. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. As the choir has pointed out, we are gathering closer to the cross and the death of Jesus Christ. And this morning's scripture reading from the Gospel of John is the moment of culmination when the leaders decide to kill Jesus. This is John chapter 11, verses 44 through 54. Listen for the word of the Lord to you this day. Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. It says the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what he had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called the meeting of the council and said, what are we to do? This man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. You do not understand that it's better for you to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. So from that day on, they planned to put him to death. Jesus, therefore, no longer walked about openly among the Jews, but went from there to a town called Ephraim in the region near the wilderness, and he remained there with the disciples. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this morning, we continue our Lenten sermon series in the cloud where we are seeking God within the cloud of prayer. We've been exploring the Buddhist meditation practice of metta or loving kindness and combining it with our own Christian tradition of prayer. And I've been crafting this sermon series using Sharon Salzberg's book, Loving Kindness, along with our scriptures. Throughout the past few weeks, we've been practicing meditation in worship and at home using the phrases of loving kindness and offering that hope for ourselves and for others. We've offered love to ourselves, to our friends and benefactors, to strangers in our lives, and even to our enemies. We've talked a bit about our emotional lives, from feelings of attachment to feelings of anger. And today we're gonna expand the practice once again as we examine Mudita, or the Buddhist idea of sympathetic joy. The practice of sympathetic joy is being truly glad when good things happen to other people. If you thought praying for your enemies was hard, this can be even more of a challenge, but it's a really important part of our spiritual growth as Christians. Sharon writes, When we take delight in the happiness of another, when you genuinely rejoice at their prosperity, success, or good fortune, rather than begrudging it in any way, then we are abiding in mudita, sympathetic joy. Unlike a state of mere excitement or giddiness, this quality of sympathetic joy challenges our deep assumptions about aloneness, loss, and happiness, and it shows us another possibility. So much of our unhappy condition as living beings comes from the constricting effect of negativity toward each other. We limit ourselves and we limit others. We judge each other. We compare ourselves to each other. We demean and envy each other. And then we ourselves suffer the strangling effects of these limitations. 
Because these are, there are so many constricting mind states that are impediments to sympathetic joy, this is considered one of the most difficult Buddhist virtues to develop. I think that sympathetic joy is really hard to develop because the forces that pull us away from it are so strong. I can feel true gladness when something good happens for my spouse or for my children, but when a colleague in ministry or somebody that I don't get along with very well is blessed, I know that I personally struggle with a lot of negative feelings about it. So we're going to take a look today at a few of the mind states that block us from feeling joy for others. And then we're going to go and look at our scriptures for parallels. One of the main things that blocks our ability to feel joy for other people is judgment. Sharon writes, it's all too easy to believe or even insist that other people should behave just as we want them to, that they should pursue lifestyles and sources of happiness in precisely the ways that we deem appropriate. And with this orientation, it's no wonder we find it difficult to be happy for the countless people out there that we cannot control. <laughs> Friends, do you see this in yourself? How often do we judge others for not living their lives the way that we think they should? I see this in this congregation as uh, people parent adult children, right? Your adult children aren't doing things the way that you think that your adult children should be doing it. Just like with anger, our judgment doesn't affect these other people at all. It just serves to make us miserable. If we're going to be non-judgmental instead, we need to let go of this attachment to what seems right to us. Other people are going to live their own lives, no matter what we think about how they're doing it. Another block to sympathetic joy is comparison. Personally, for me, this is it. This is the one for me, the one I struggle with. Sharon writes, Comparing ourselves to others is a very powerful mental affliction. In Buddhist psychology, they call it conceit. When we're enmeshed in conceit, we're pulled outside of ourselves, trying to know who we are and what our experience is by comparing ourselves to others. Whether we conclude that we're better than, worse than, or equal to another, when we measure ourselves against somebody else, it causes harm. As we constantly try to decide through comparison with others who we are, and what is important about us, whether or not we're happy, that churning of the mind in itself undermines our happiness. So comparison or conceit, it's like a gnawing, painful restlessness. And it can never bring us peace because there's no end to the possibilities for comparison in our lives. My friends, this is me. So you can go out and tell everybody that your pastor's conceited. I am. This is my struggle. I know this is my block to happiness and sympathetic joy. I'm comparing all of the time, all of the time. For example, every night I watch a yoga video and I do 15 minutes of yoga before I go to bed, a 15 minute bedtime yoga routine every night. And sometimes my husband Lars will come in the room and do some poses because I'm there doing yoga. So he'll come in the room and start doing yoga. And immediately my mind will lose focus on my own yoga practice. And I will start looking at Lars and saying, well, what is Lars doing? And how is he doing? And how deep is he going in that stretch? And can I go deeper than he is? And can I do better than Lars is? And it is so stupid. <laughs> the whole point of yoga is that it's not competitive. It's just you and your body. I hate that I do it. And I find myself doing it all the time. So now imagine what happens in my mind when another pastor I know publishes a book or gets a job at a big church. Oh, I know that for me, comparison, comparison is my negative mind state and it blocks me from happiness. In Sharon's book, she writes that the issue that blocks her often is prejudice. It's a lot easier to be happy for the people we love than to be happy for people that we don't like. And Sharon has a great story about this one. She says, the willingness to feel goodwill only toward those we like is a really powerful impediment to developing sympathetic joy. Crossing that line of discrimination from people we like to people we dislike can be really difficult. 
She says, I encountered this when I was first doing intensive meta practice in Burma and was asked to direct meta toward an enemy. And when done with strong concentration, we were being taught that meta can reach that person that it's directed toward. If he or she is open to receive it, meta can provide them with comfort and happiness. And so she says, as I sat there trying to decide which person to choose as my difficult person, I kept saying, well, I better not choose them. What if I get really concentrated and they get some good vibes from my meta? Oh. Oh. Friends, maybe the issue that blocks you from feeling joy for others is envy. Sharon writes, envy, as we all know to our distress, is the inability to endure the success, prosperity, or happiness of others. It hates to see these things for other people. And the experience of envy only functions to produce more and more dissatisfaction with us, our own condition in life. It makes us miserable. Envy devours us. We cease to be centered within our own lives, but instead of perpetually out of balance as we lean into the lives of other people, regretting their happiness, real or imagined. All of these feelings and thought processes, judgment, comparing, prejudice, envy, they don't do anything to hurt the people we don't like. They're just ways to torture ourselves and create our own unhappiness. If we can let these things go, if we can learn to feel genuine happiness for each other, then we will all live better lives. And this is what Paul was talking about when he writes to the church in Galatia. He reminds the community that they're called to love one another. If they wander into their own sinful states, their community will be destroyed. And he lists these things that drive us apart, strife. Jealousy, anger, dissension, envy. These are the exact same mindset that we are talking about right now today. And by contrast, the fruit of the spirit, the harvest of an abundant prayer life is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and generosity. These are exactly the states of mind that we're trying to achieve by offering loving kindness to the people around us and by trying to be happy for other people in their moments of blessing. Paul teaches that these fruits of the spirit are for individuals and they are for the community. And I too am hoping that this prayer practice will be a blessing for us as individuals and as a community. The thing about bearing spiritual fruit is that it depends on God, right? We can tend the garden, we can till the soil, but we are waiting. We are waiting on God for the fruit. And so this Lenten season has been an opportunity for us to grow in our prayer practice in the hopes that we can reap a harvest of love together. As we draw closer to Easter, I want to reconnect with this story of Jesus Christ. We're getting close to Good Friday, and the traditional scripture readings for this season are moving ever closer to that night. And I want to look at how these things, jealousy and strife, led to the death of Jesus. In our reading from John, Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. I mean, is there not a better occasion for sympathetic joy? Shouldn't have everyone been so happy? The surrounding community should have been overwhelmed with joy to see the power of God in such a way, literally raising somebody from the dead. But jealousy and comparison rule the day instead. When the ruling Jewish elite see what Jesus has done, they're consumed by their jealousy. They fear that Jesus' power and popularity will continue to grow and, quote, everyone will follow him. They fear losing their own power within the religious and political structure. And so, they begin to make plans to kill Jesus. Can we imagine a different ending to the story? Would it have been possible for them to rejoice with Jesus and the community instead? Is there not enough God to go around? The raising of Lazarus shows that all of the claims Jesus had been making about his power were true. 
And it's hard to imagine that the religious leaders would not have been jealous. I know I would have been jealous. Judgment, comparing, prejudice, and envy all play a critical role in the death of Jesus Christ. And they serve to silence his ministry as Jesus therefore no longer walked about openly. Today, for our meditation, we're going to practice sympathetic joy. And I think this will be the hardest one we do. So once you get through today, everything gets easy again. In this practice, we're going to use the phrases of loving kindness, but the particular flavor is rejoicing. Rejoicing. We reflect on the capacity that everybody has for happiness, for understanding, for love and for compassion. So let's begin the meditation. See if you can sit comfortably. You can close your eyes or not, however you feel most at ease. Take a few deep breaths and relax your body. The first recipient of sympathetic joy is somebody we know who's doing pretty well. They may not be perfectly happy, but in some area of their life, they're enjoying success or good fortune. So if someone like that comes to mind, you can bring them here. Get an image of them. Say their name to yourself. Get a feeling for their presence and offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. May you be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. Remember that this practice isn't about trying to fabricate a certain feeling, but it's about paying attention in a different way. May you be safe, be happy, be healthy, live with ease. If you find one of the challenges to sympathetic joy arising, like jealousy or comparison, see if you can let it go. But if it's too strong, then use this as a chance to offer loving kindness for yourself. See now if you can think of a friend, the first friend that comes to mind. Get a feeling for their presence. Offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. May you be safe. Be happy. Be healthy. Live with ease.
we'll close our session this morning by offering sympathetic joy to a neutral person. We don't need to know the circumstances of their life, just that they have the potential for great joy. Get an image of them. Say their name to yourself if you know it. And offer the phrases of loving kindness to them. May you be safe. Be happy. Be healthy. Live with ease. Now you can open your eyes and reconnect with the world around you. Sometimes people feel dismayed when we look at this because they notice quite a lot of envy and jealousy in their own minds and they feel it shouldn't be there. And I wanna invite you to remember that this is how you've lived your whole life is a product of conditioning and habit. So don't take it personally. And don't feel bad for yourself. This practice is all about noticing. Notice and see the habits that you have so that you can let go of them. Practicing sympathetic joy is a way to do this. As you go through this week, I encourage you to look for opportunities for sympathetic joy. When something good happens for somebody else, can you feel happy for them? It's a kind of generosity, like a giving of a gift. Every time we witness somebody's success or good fortune, this opportunity is there for us to respond. And even if your body responds the way, like mine will, which is instantly being jealous or comparing that I'm not as good as them because they got a thing, I can have a second thought, which is yes, but this is an opportunity to notice what I'm doing and to train myself to do something different, to have compassion for myself and for them and to practice joy instead. Again, you have a handout for this week. I encourage you to practice this loving kindness meditation at home. We're getting there, friends. We have two more weeks, and then you'll be free from meditation and worship and, and this pressure to, to practice at home. But I want you to know that I, too, am praying with you every day. I am doing what I am asking you to do every day. And, and some days it's really great, and some days it just is. So I pray that God would continue to meet us as we seek God in this cloud of prayer. Amen.
please be seated. We come now to our time of prayer and sharing our joys and concerns together as a community. And I'm wondering what joys and concerns folks have that they would like to share today. Susan. A joy for E.J. Smith and his new wife, Melanie, who were married yesterday. May they have joy in happiness through the bad times. <laughs> Prayers for DJ and Melody, who got married yesterday. DJ is Carrie. Carrie's son. Remember Greg and Carrie that used to come. Carrie's son is DJ. So celebration for all of them. Jerry. Oh, my gosh. Mississippi. Those in Mississippi affected by that giant tornado. It's just this time of loss, definitely. Others today, Tara. Yeah. Play more. Prayers of Thanksgiving for Tara's great nephew, Claymore. Others, choice or concerns today? Yeah. Prayers for Rebecca. She's struggling with home health care. Others? Yeah, Cindy. Yeah. Prayers for Malawi with Hurricane Freddie. Others? Yeah, Tom. Uh, Carolyn sends blessings for Shonda. Blessings for Shonda. Others, choice or concerns? All right, friends. Once again, let us turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Spirit of the living God, we cry to you out of the depths. We live in the gap between resurrections, longing to hear you speak life to our weary souls. Hear our voices this day as we say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We cry out with those whose bones are dried up, suffering from chronic illness, the persistent weight of oppression, and the ongoing effects of poverty. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We raise our voices with those whose hope is lost, weighted down by the ebb and flow of grief, exhausted by violence and abuse. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We sit in solidarity with those who feel cut off completely, mired in the depths of loneliness, relegated to the margins of society, shunned and forgotten by those who should love them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We gather together sharing our joys and our griefs, which we bring before you now as a community in prayer. We pray for the people of Mississippi in this time of extreme loss and devastation. Lord, may they feel the power of your spirit among them. We pray for the people of Malawi as they struggle to recover from Hurricane Freddie. We pray for Rebecca, that she would be able to find new home health care. We pray for Shonda. She loves and cares for all of this good creation. We give you thanks for joys. For the birth of Claymore, we ask your blessing upon his parents and his life. And for the marriage of DJ and Melody, we pray that you would bless their union. We continue to remember those on our prayer list. Prayers of your healing presence with Conan and Margaret and Michael. We pray for those who have suffered abuse. For those looking for work. For those deployed 
and for their families, for first responders and their families, for this good earth, this country, and this church, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you know the private prayers that lie deep in our hearts this day. So we offer them to you now in this moment of silence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O great advocate and comforter, through your radiant present, teach us that the sorrows that grieve us disturb your spirit too. Enliven our spirits with your steadfast love, even as we wait for your redemption through Jesus Christ, the one who has taught us to pray, saying together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Without the breath of God, we are but dry bones. Without the word of God, we are but dust. With gratitude, let us offer our lives to the Lord of all life. I invite you now to present before the Lord your tithes, your gifts, and your very hearts as Cynthia presents a gift of music. God, you are the giver of life. We thank you for raising us up and joining us together as one people, your people, flesh and bone in the body of Christ. As you have delivered us from death, use our lives to proclaim the good news of new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.
My friends, go forth from this place in peace to love and serve the Lord and be blessed by the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.